Yeah, I welcome you again this NPTEL online course on earthquake geotechnical engineering and this is lecture number 50. So, this is half century and uh, we are like uh, have the uh, like uh, uh, under module 5 of this course on, which is on slope stability and retaining walls. This is in fact the fifth lecture on retaining walls where we already covered seismic pressure on retaining walls and today we are going to talk partly on seismic pressure on retaining walls and that will be over. Once that is over then we are going to talk about seismic displacement of retaining wall also. So, let us start from seismic pressure on retaining walls and which is in chapter number 7 which is continuing from the last lectures rather last two lectures this is third lecture on seismic pressure on retaining walls. And what we are going to talk today in this lecture number 50, 50th effect of water on wall pressure when you calculate the seismic pressure then which is will be done with water outward of wall and water inside the backfill. And then we are going to talk about finite element analysis for the analysis for the seismic uh, basically for uh, seismic pressure. Then once the seismic pressure is over then we are going to talk seismic displacement of retaining walls which will be another chapter and that will be discussed in under three heads. One is Richard's Alms method, second Whiteman Leo method and the third is finite element analysis. So, let us start from effect of water on wall pressure, but before going ahead let me acknowledge that most of the material taken is from the Kremers book. Coming through effects of water on wall pressures, the procedures for estimation of seismic load on retaining walls which is described have been limited to cases of dry backfills. So, whatever we have discussed so far, we assume that backfill was dry, but that is not the real scenario. In a real case, most of the retaining walls are designed with drains to prevent water from building up within the backfill. For example, weep holes are provided. So, weep holes are provided and water drained out of the backfill, then it is okay, but it is not always possible. And even if it is drained out, still there may be some water inside the backfill, and this has been not considered. So, this is not possible for retaining walls in waterfront, particularly in waterfront areas where most earthquake induced wall failures have been observed. During the past earthquake it has been observed if your retaining wall is uh, in the waterfront areas for example, near the rivers if you have the bridge of abutment passing through the river or you have the some pond or like this reservoir conditions are there or for, uh, for example, if you have bridges or maybe like well foundations uh, there if some retaining walls are provided near for those structures they may be in the uh, near the water bodies. So, in that case it is not possible to that your the backfill is dry. The presence of water plays a strong role in determining the loads on waterfront retaining walls both during and after earthquakes. So, and this will not only during, but after the earthquakes also. Water outbound of uh, board of a retaining wall can exert dynamic pressures on the face of the wall. Water within a backfill can also affect the dynamic pressures that act on the back of the wall. Proper consideration of the effects of water is essential for the seismic design of retaining structures particularly in waterfront areas. So, that means when we design these uh, retaining walls it is necessary that we should consider that the amount of water which is the what is the effect of water which apply on the wall pressure including the seismic. The total water pressure that act on retaining walls in the absence of seepage within the backfill can be divided into two components. What are these two components? One com first component let us say hydrostatic pressure and this component increases linearly with the depth and it act on the wall before, during and after earthquake shaking. So, this component will act on the wall before the earthquake, during the earthquake and after earthquake shaking. That means, it is kind of continuous. Uh, the hydrostatic pressure which is applied is nothing to do with earthquake loading because its name is hydrostatic pressure. So, it will continuously applied without earthquake and with earthquake also. So, that first component continuous. It does not vary with the time. The second component is hydrodynamic pressure and as dynamic is coming which result from the dynamic response of the water itself and this dynamic response of the water is due to earthquake loading. 
So, we need to consider both the components hydrostatic pressure as hydrodynamic pressure. Hydrodynamic water pressure result from the dynamic response of body of water that how the waters respond to the earthquake loading which is the for retaining walls hydrodynamic pressures are usually estimated from what is we call west guard solution for the case of a vertical ridge dam retaining a semi infinite reservoir of water that is excited by harmonic horizontal motion of the ridge base. So, you have a ridge base let us say a tank and if I apply the horizontal motion which is harmonic excitation let us say sinusoidal wave and other thing. So, west guard solution give you that how you can calculate hydrodynamic pressure. So, for calculation of hydrodynamic pressure can be done using west guard solution. Now, in West Guard, what has been showed that the hydrodynamic pressure amplitude increased with the square root of wa water depth Zw and Zw measured from the top. When motion is applied at a frequency lower than the fundamental frequency of the reservoir, fundamental frequency of the reservoir can be calculated F0 Vp by 4h, where Vp is the P wave velocity, not the shear wave velocity. If let us say Vp, if I assume as a 2000 meter per second and h thickness of the is 10 meter in that case vp by 4 h will come uh, like 40 2000 by 40 so you will get 50 hertz so this fundamental frequency of the reservoir is quite higher compared to the earthquake wave which we consider uh, like for the typically our uh, for earthquake you may not have more than 5 hertz so this is quite greater than 5 hertz. So, naturally this condition satisfied that the motion is applied at a frequency lower than the fundamental frequency of the reservoir. So, most of the time motion is applied at a frequency which is quite low compared to the fundamental frequency of the reservoir. As a result, we can use the West Guard solution. Now, in the West Guard uh, solution what is there? Computed the amplitude of the hydronic pressure is given from this relation. AH, AH by G is nothing but this, this is KH basically if I can say that this ratio will be coefficient of horizontal earth pressure, coefficient of uh, uh, like pseudo uh, aesthetic coefficient of uh, horizontal in the horizontal direction. Gamma W is the unit rate of water, ZW is the depth of the water level from the top and H is the total thickness of the wall. If you integrate this was the distribution of pressure, the resultant hydrodynamic thrust is given from this relation P 7 by 12 A h by G gamma W into H square. And here naturally this is total, so it is coming after integration over the height of the wall. So, Z W is come, does not come in picture rather than you get this. The total water pressure on the face of the wall is the sum of the hydrostatic and hydrodynamic water pressures. So, hydrostatic water pressure which does not vary with the time and you calculate and the second component hydrodynamic pressure which varies with the time and uh, you can calculate the maximum value and then total will be the sum of both the cases. Continue with the water outboard uh, of wall. Another important consideration of the design of waterfront retaining wall is the potential for rapid drawdown of the water outward of the wall. <coughs> Earthquakes which are occurring near large bodies of water often induce long period motion of the water. Uh, for example, such as tsunamis or seaches long period you know that long period wave in the long period wave what you will have you will have like kind of a flat that means and then you have another peak which may go. So, your wavelength will be like uh, this kind of so your wavelength will be peak to peak or yeah, I can say this will be my long wave, wave wavelength. So, this is lambda. So, if your lambda is higher what happens in case of tsunamis when the tsunamis are traveling inside the sea. Uh, it is very difficult to visualize from the neck eye. Why? Because compared to their amplitude which may be in meters, their wavelength is in kilometers or maybe 100 kilometer. So, that is not visible. This wave look like a flat. Compared to their amplitude, wavelength is quite large. So, as a result, large water would induce long period motion of the water such as tsunamis that cause the water surface to move up and down. While the upward movement of water outward of retaining wall will generally tend to stabilize the wall. If it is upward movement, then it will be going to help, uh, it is expected that it will establish the wall. 
assuming that it does not rise above the level of the top of the wall. Of course, it should not go beyond the top of the wall, otherwise uh, uh, water will be spilled out. How a downward movement can create a destabilizing rapid drawdown condition that and wall should be designed for that. When liquefiable soil exists under relatively high levels of initial shear stress, failures can be triggered by very small changes in water level. And such failure can originate in the soil which is adjacent to or beneath the retaining structures rather than in the backfill. And this can start uh, which is like backfill which is just uh, below, below the retaining wall rather than in the backfill. So, this was about water outward of wall, but there could be water which is like this was the water which is you can say that applying the some force directly on the wall, but there could be water inside the backfill and the presence of water in the backfill behind the retaining wall can influence the seismic load which act on the wall and this can influence in three ways. How three ways? First, by altering the inertial forces within the backfill. So, within the backfill it can alter the inertial forces by developing hydrodynamic pressures within the backfill, by allowing EPP generation that is excess pore pressure generation due to cyclic straining of the backfill soils. So, the third component is related to the cyclic loading due to earthquake and other things. While the first two components could be even without earthquake, uh, like the first one particularly could be without earthquake. The second one because being hydrodynamic pressure, so it will require uh, the earthquake force. Coming to water, uh, the initial forces, the first one, the initial forces in saturated soils depends on the relative movement between the backfill and particles. Of, uh, uh, between the uh, backfill soil particles and the pore water pressure that surround them. So, you have one side the soil particle on another side you have this uh, pore water pressure. So, if there is a relative movement between these two then uh, this inertial forces will depends on the relative movement between these two. If permeability of the soil is small enough the pore water moves uh, with the soil during earthquake shaking. No relative movement of soil and water or rest and pore water condition, the inertial forces will be proportional to the uh, total unit weight of the soil. So, if unit weight of the soil is uh, uh, more, it is you, you can expect the inertial force will be large and this is because it is due to the weight of the soil. So, it is expected. If the permeability of the backfill soil is very high, if permeability is high, in that case the pore water may remain essentially stationary because it may not escape uh, for the high perm. While the soil skeleton moves back and forth, in such cases inertial forces will be proportional to the buoyant force submerged unit weight of the soil. In case of the second condition which is uh, developing hydrodynamic pressure, hydrodynamic water pressures can also develop under free po uh, what pore water condition and must be added to the computed soil, uh, soil and hydrostatic pressure to obtain the total loading on the wall. The third one for rest and pore water conditions, the MO method can be modified to account for the presence of pore water within the backfill that pore water EPP, EPP stands for excess pore pressure. The active soil thrust acting on the inlay wall can be computed from this relation gamma equal to gamma B 1 minus RU. What is RU? RU is nothing but uh, the ratio the pore water pressure ratio which is normally you calculate like uh, uh, Ru uh, is calculated by uh, U into some sigma effective overburden pressure. So, the pore water pressure ratio and once Ru is known then you can calculate the value of psi 10 inverse gamma set saturated unit weight into Kh into gamma B summer unit weight and Ru we already discussed Kh and Kv is already known which is horizontal seismic coefficient and kv vertical seismic coefficient. An equivalent hydrostatic thrust based on a fluid of unit weight gamma equivalent which is gamma w plus r u into gamma b. So, gamma equivalent will be gamma w, gamma w is the unit weight of the water and if your r u equal to 0 then this will be gamma w only, but r u equal to 1 then you will have gamma w plus gamma b, where r u 1 means full liquefaction is there that should be added. Similarly, the soil thrust from partially submerged backfills may be computed using an average unit weight based on the relative volume of the soil. So, the, in that case you calculate the volume of the, soil, the uh, average unit weight gamma bar 
this gamma bar is calculated using this relation lambda is equal to gamma set 1 minus gamma d. Where what is lambda here? Lambda it can be in this case water in vac fill. You have the height total height of the retaining wall is capital H and lambda H is the uh, height up to which water level is coming. So, this basically lambda H is denoting the location of water table in this case. And in this case again the hydrostatic thrust and the hydrodynamic thrust if present must be added to the soil thrust. So, this was about all together in water and backfill. Now, there is third type of analysis uh, like also called finite element analysis. In case of finite element analysis, earthquake induced pressures on retaining walls can also be evaluated using dynamic response analysis. So, we carried out what we call the dynamic response analysis and using the finite element analysis you can do many things that is possible. A number of computer programs are available for such analysis. Linear or equivalent linear analysis can be used to estimate wall pressures although their inability to represent actual modes of failure can make their results difficult to in interpret. So, a linear or equivalent linear because of the soil behavior is not linear or even may not be no equivalent linear. However, nonlinear analysis are capable of predicting permanent deformations as well as wall pressures. So, the finite element analysis are versatile and particularly it they can deal with the nonlinear analysis. So, this was all about uh, uh, this uh, then let us talk about seismic displacement of retaining walls. So, the seismic displacement of retaining walls uh, that is the chapter number 8 some of this uh, the one slide is here. Uh, the post earthquake serviceability of retaining walls is more closely related to the permanent deformation that occur during earthquakes. While large permanent deformations may be acceptable for some walls others may be considered to have failed to much smaller deformations. Analysis that per predict permanent wall deformations may provide a more useful indication of retaining wall performance. So, one side you calculate the seismic pressure that is fine, but if you are able to calculate the deformations also then that is better. So, it is similar to what we have discussed you know that uh, uh, the Newmark sliding block analysis. Newmark sliding block analysis not only give you the factor of safety against the you know the stability, but it also provide you the some information deformation. So, similarly uh, there are three methods which are going to discuss in this case uh, for the seismic displacement and first method is Richards Elms method which we are going to discuss in detail. Richards and Elms in 1979 proposed a method for the seismic design of gravity wall based on allowable permanent wall displacement. The method estimates permanent displacement in a manner which is analogous to the Newmark sliding block analysis which is developed for basically from seismic slope stability we have which we have already discussed. Application of the Richards Elms method requires evaluation of the yield acceleration for the wall backfill system. Like in case of New Newmark sliding block method also if you recall when we discuss with the slope uh, like you know the slope stability there was a ay yield acceleration which was nothing but ky into g. So, yield acceleration. So, in similar way Richard Hulse method also required the yield acceleration for the wall backfill system. So, the value of ay will be required here also. So, let us for an application of Richard Helms method consider the gravity wall which is shown in the figure and in this gravity wall what you have w, uh, like this is a wall. What is W? Capital W is the weight of the wall itself which is always act vertically downward direction. FH is the horizontal force which is applied due to the let us say earthquake which is FH is normally KH into W, uh, KH into W which is acting outward direction for active pressure condition. The total active pressure PAE can be divided in two components one is horizontal component PAEH and then another is PAEV. Then at the base of the wall you have the reaction in the form of normal reaction N and thrust T. So, N and T will be balancing other forces and the we need to consider the force equilibrium. So, when the active age is subjected to acceleration acting toward the backfill the resulting horizontal forces will act away from the backfill. So, this horizontal force will when you want to move the wall towards the backfill 
then reaction will come outside and this uh, this uh, the inertial force will act away from the back wheel. The level of acceleration that is just large enough to cause the wall to slide on its base is the yield acceleration. So, what you do? If I find out uh, equate the total horizontal forces in this direction T is acting. So, T capital should T should be equal to FH plus PAE into H. P, so, PAE H and FH. Similarly, N will be W plus PAE V. So, this is the equilibrium in the horizontal direction this this is in vertical direction. Now, substitute T there is a relation between T and N T is N multiplied by 10 phi B. What is phi B? Phi B is angle of friction between soil and wall at the base Y B B means base at the base. So, 10 phi B and F H is nothing but A Y by W G which is we said A Y B G W G which just I said K H into W. So, F H is also known to you. So, if I sub and then what is P A E H which P A E cos delta plus theta and while well P A E is sin delta plus theta. What is delta and theta in this equation? Uh, as you know that here wall is not uh, vertical. So, theta will be this angle which is which this wall max with the vertical theta will be this angle theta is this angle. What is delta? Delta is basically uh, if I draw the normal to this wall here and delta will be what this P A E max with this is this angle delta that is the friction between the soil and wall at this uh, backfill near the backfill. So, delta and theta is known then P A E into cos delta plus theta and P A E into sin delta plus theta. So, that means P A E H and this is known we substitute and then we solve this equation. So, ultimately the yield acceleration can be computed using this expression A y equal to 10 phi b minus P A E and the, what is in this equation phi b is the angle of friction at the base delta and theta we already discussed and P A E and P A E is the total earth pressure active earth pressure. And then whatever you get should be multiplied by g to calculate the acceleration. The Richards and Elms recommend that P A E be calculated using the M O method. Since the M O methods now here the uh, calculation of P A E requires M O method. However, M O methods also require the, that A Y B be known that is the yield acceleration should be known in the M O method and yield acceleration is not known. So, what you do you assume some value of yield acceleration then using MO method calculate the value of P A E and once P A E is known then calculate the value of A Y. Now, this A Y will be different than the A Y which you have assumed if it is same then you can say it is final value final answer, but if there is a difference then you again revise the P A E calculate A Y and this need to be calculated iteratively until you reach the convergence. Using the results of sliding block analysis in the same manner as Newmark 1965, Richards and Elms propose the following expression for permanent block displacement, where permanent uh, displacement is given by 0 0.087 V max square A max cube divided by F A Y 4. So, in this expression what is V max? Maximum wave velocity, what is A max? PGA, maximum acceleration due to the earthquake which is P ground acceleration, A max can be compared with PGA and A y is yield acceleration and this uh, equation will be applicable when the ratio of A y by A max is greater than or equal to 0.3. The above equation provides displacement estimates that are close to the estimated maximum displacement of Newmark of 1965. So, it has been opt, uh, observed that the displacement which is estimated from the above equations are very close to the displacement calculated from Newmark methods Q. Uh, so, this was all about Richards Elms method. There is another researchers uh, Whiteman and Leo methods which they also did uh, for uh, to find out the seismic displacement retaining was. The Richard Elms method offers a rational deterministic approach to the estimation of gravity wall displacement. Its simplicity comes in part from assumption that they neglect certain aspects of the dynamic earth pressure problem. Whiteman and Leo in 1985 initially identified several mod mo modeling errors that result from the simplifying engine from the Richards-Elmson processor. So, some errors which are in the 
uh, white uh, like Richard Elms method has been overcome by Whiteman and Leo. The most important of these are neglect on the dynamic response of the backfill, neglect of kinematic factors, neglect of tilting mechanics, mechanism and neglect of vertical acceleration. So, so many things have been neglected in case of uh, uh, Richard Elms method. However, consideration of vertical acceleration produces slightly larger displacement th than when they are neglected at least for mo motions with high peak ground acceleration that means A max is greater than 0.5 g uh, when and A y A max is greater than 0.4. So, A y means yield acceleration will be 0.4 times of P g A while P g A should be itself is greater than 0.5 g. So, in this case if you have very high P g A value then an errors will be large. Using the results of sliding block analysis of 14 ground motions by Wong, Whiteman and Leo found that the permanent displacement were log normally distributed within mean value which is given from this relation and again we discuss V max and A max, A y and A max and uncertainty due to sta statical variability of ground motions was characterized by a log normally distributed random variable which is Q with a mean value of Q bar and standard deviation log sigma log Q. So, the effects of uncertainty in soil properties, specifically the friction angles on permanent displacement were also investigated by Whiteman and Leo. Using standard deviations of sigma phi, let us say 2 to 3 degree, for soil angles about delta uh, sigma delta about 5 degree, for wall soil interfraction angles, so this 2 to 3 degrees for soil friction angles. So, this is one group and this delta phi for soil valve internal friction angles. The computed yield acceleration that is a function of phi and delta was defined as a random variable with mean value a y bar and standard deviation sigma a y. The mean value a y bar is the yield acceleration computed using the mean values of phi and delta. To calculate the value of a y bar you will require phi as well as delta. Combining of all of these sources of uncertainty the permanent displacement can be characterized using a log normally distributed random variable with mean value which is given from this relation which is quite similar as the relation which we have seen last uh, 37 Amx uh, exactly only that two these two factors Q and uh, Q bar and M bar has been added to overcome the uncertainties and with the variation log uh, uh, d uh, this sigma log d can be calculated from this relation where sigma a y is standard deviation in yield acceleration sigma log m in the factor magnitude and this is in the thrust. So, all these combines you can find the variance also. So, that with that uncertainty can be accounted. Whiteman and Leo methods mean and standard deviation values for gravity wall displacement analysis is shown here. For modal error this is like uh, m bar 3.5, a y bar a y phi bar delta bar and q bar 1. So, standard deviation are listed here for the first case uh, standard deviation for m is 0.84 for a y it varies from 0.04 to 0.065 and q from 0.5 to 1.05. So, there is a large variation in standard deviation it is minimum for a y, but it is maximum for q. So, the last one for calculation uh, like uh, seismic displacements of retaining wall can also be calculated using what we call finite element analysis. Earthquake induced deformation of retaining walls can be predicted by dynamic stress deformation analysis. Obviously, prediction of permanent deformations require the use of a nonlinear analysis. So, nonlinear analysis required to be carried out. A rigorous analysis should be capable of accounting for nonlinear inelastic behavior of the soil and of the interfaces between the soil and wall elements. Rigorous 2D finite element analysis that predict permanent deformations are those reported by some of the researchers. For example, Alpampali and Elegamal in 1990, Finn et al. in 1992, and Lai and Kamekoa in 1993. So, there are so many uh, like uh, researchers which we work uh, to find the seismic displacement of retaining walls using finite element analysis. With this, I uh, this lecture or 50th lecture is over and we are done with seismic, uh, seismic pressure on retaining walls as well as seismic uh, displacement on retaining walls. In the next lecture, we will discuss uh, that is 
seismic design consideration for retaining walls and that will be the last lecture on this retaining walls. Thank you very much for your kind attention.